I'm Shelley Van Leer and I'm really interested in the slow way of growing things and producing things that make them into fast foods and to get back to the traditional way of eating and preparing foods mm -hmm. to understand it a little better. Well, and a lot of people don't have any idea what you're talking about, do they? <laughs> Probably not. Most people look at me kind of funny when I say things like that, but um, there's just so much to it and I like to share with people as much as I can mm -hmm. so that I'm not alone out here trying to figure out where the poisons in our community come from and how they get in our bodies and how we can avoid them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is a moral act. Eating is a moral act. Eating is a moral act. Um, being put on by the Greater Grand Rapids Food Systems Council, which is also just getting started. Today we're going to have Paul Stankowitz uh, with the Catholic Rural Life Coalition or conference speaking. And Amy Sherman, who is a pastry chef at Tuscan Express, is uh, coming and she's going to talk with us about the, um, the joy of eating. And she's going to be uh, taking some thoughts from the slow food movement. And Paul is going to be talking about the morality of eating, eating and talking about um, generally some of the, the issues and concerns with regards to where, where where, how, why we get our food. I just uh, want to make a brief uh, introduction about the Food Systems Council. Uh, it's a, a new organization that um, is a collaborative that involves local government, uh, health individuals, um, farmers, environmental people, conservation folks, um, a really broad range of uh, neighborhood individuals, hunger advocates, uh, business people, and we're looking at how we can start to work on creating a more just and a more sustainable local food system. And the food system is that sort of big process that delivers food to our stores, uh, supports um, farmers with their chemicals and their uh, tax supports and the machinery and everything in there that uh, moves it, processes it, distributes it, and um, we're trying to find ways to make it more simple, more close to home, uh, more personal, and much more efficient and much more effective. Three subgroups of the Food Systems Council, and actually going to be a fourth one. Um, the Education Committee, um, which is the group that has put on this event and will be putting on future um, Food for Thought uh, brown bag lunches. And their next meeting is going to be July 17th, uh, and probably either the Alpine Township or the Alpine Township Fire Hall, and they'll be at 5 p.m. If you want to know more about that, contact Cynthia. We also have a producer and marketing meeting, and there we're trying to get producers and uh, marketing and uh, retail, uh, restaurant, and other individuals together to talk about how can we better connect um, ag production and uh, local consumption. <coughs> and the next meeting of that, I'm not certain what the day is, but I, I think it's uh, within the first week of August. Um, and anybody who wants to know more about that, they can contact me and I will get them on the mailing list and, and get information out there. We're also, um, we also have a uh, access committee which is going to be working on um, how can we improve local access to, to food for all people in the community, especially low income people. planning to hold our, our first uh, board meeting on July 10th. And we are now recruiting board members to be part of that. So many of you may be receiving letters. <laughs> um, okay, with that said, uh, just some, a very brief introduction to uh, Paul, who's going to be our first speaker. 
Uh, Paul is a native of Royal Oak, Michigan. He attended Michigan State University and obtained his bachelor's from James Madison in urban policy and a master's in public administration. Uh, he served as city manager of Onaway, Michigan uh, from 1988 to 2001. He joined uh, the, became director of the Catholic World Life Coalition in February of 2001, where he helps raise awareness uh, within the Catholic community on food, land, and environmental issues. He's also working with the Michigan Catholic Ref, uh, Conference and the Michigan uh, Catholic World Life Coalition addressing public policy issues on Michigan state and federal legislators, or with uh, state and federal legislators. And Paul and his wife Diane have three young children and reside in Elma, Michigan. And with that, Paul, uh, take her away. Tom mentioned I'm a former small town politician, so if I can do away with the microphone, if you can hear me all right, it's very dangerous to give me this if you want to get home in time for dinner. So uh, <laughs> please trust me. Well, it's it's always pleasant to be in a church setting when we when I give this talk, and uh, whether it's Catholic or Episcopal or, or a synagogue, whatever else, doesn't really matter. I think all people of faith, and just people of goodwill, should be aware of where their food comes from, what things have been changing in our country over the last 20 or 30 years, and how it's going to impact us severely in the future. So if some of you are already in, involved in food issues and are aware of a lot of these different things we're going to speak about today, I want to be preaching to the choir. But as you all know, a good choir needs practice. So maybe we'll <laughs> learn some new harmonies today together and some new songs. If you're not a member of the choir, then this is going to be brand new to you, and I hopefully, hopefully it will be quite enjoyable. Uh, this is my sixth time this month in Grand Rapids, so even though I'm not living in the area, I feel like a resident and a neighbor to you, so uh, thank you for, for welcoming me. And where's the first trick here? Who can tell me? I see some of you brought your own food today, which is nice, but uh, aside from the obvious, what does this represent? Oh, yeah. Why? Yeah. I actually bought this myself, so don't be too hard on me. What does this right. represent? Right. Well, wages, heart disease. Fast food, deforestation, etc. Very good. And I'm sorry. A lot of land. A lot of land being lost. It's also it's also true. Um, McDonald's is a very good symbol of, of fast food um, in general, and in particular, the way it's changed our whole way of eating. McDonald's and fast food in general. So whether it's Wendy's or Burger King, or my old alma mater, um, Burger Chef, which is now long gone. Um, I'll use McDonald's as an example, so I don't mean to just pick on them because I do actually support them with my money. Got kids, and what can I say? That's, that's, that's where we go. Which is a good example of how advertising affects us all. To be a good parent, going to McDonald's to buy Happy Meals is something that you do. Yeah. Kids are very happy with that, and that's that's how you, you satisfy their hunger and their, their uh, rambunctiousness in the backseat by going to, to fast food. So aside from, aside from that, McDonald's has changed things um, through standardization. McDonald's is so large. I think it's actually the, the largest retail property owner in the world in terms of its number of outlets and where it's located. You cannot be the best apple grower up on a ridge and go to a local McDonald's and say, I've got the filling for your food pies. Because there's one big apple company somewhere that supplies all the apples to McDonald's. You cannot be the best potato farmer up in my old neck of the woods in Posey, Michigan. And the best potatoes and go to the local Roger City McDonald's and say, this will make the best French fries because there's one big company out in Idaho or wherever they keep potatoes that supplies McDonald's. So if you're an average small town farmer in Michigan, you cannot break into that segment of the food industry. The same goes for grocery stores and the lack of processing plants now around the country has made it very difficult for farmers to stay in business just on the fact, not because their food's no good, not because it's good quality, they just can't get a place to sell it, aside from a roadside stand or a farmer's market, which we'll talk about in a little bit. I don't know how many of you have read the Fast Food Nation book, and Amy's going to talk a little bit about slow food in a few moments, but I would highly recommend this book. This is the best thing I've read in going on two years now on this entire entire topic. So if I may read to you from the book here at the church, a couple of, and this is just right from the introductory um, chapter. How many of you have been to fast food in the last uh, couple of years, <laughs> or a couple of weeks, a couple of days or something? One out, of, one out of four Americans will go to a fast food restaurant today. So it's very persuasive, per pervasive and persuasive in our society. I've given a few talks before that I, I get the MSU Organic Conference back in March. All vegetarians, not a, one of, not a one of them had been to McDonald's in five years, so this kind of fell on, on deaf ears. But 
You pull open the glass door, you feel the rush of cool air. You walk in, get in line, study the color photographs above the counter. You place your order, hand over a few dollars, and watch teenagers in brightly colored uniforms pushing various buttons. Moments later, you take hold of a plastic tray full of food wrapped in colored paper and cardboard. The whole experience of buying fast food has become so routine, so mundane, it is now taken for granted, like brushing your teeth or stopping for a red light. It has become a social custom, as American as a small, rectangular, handheld, frozen, and reheated apple pie. <laughs> well, the cool air is going really nice though, so that might be something to look at later. A generation ago, three quarters of the money used to buy food in the U.S. was spent to prepare meals at home. Today, about half the money is used to buy food, is spent at restaurants, mainly fast food. This is, this is the great, great thing here. An estimated one out of eight workers in the U.S. has at some point worked for McDonald's. Wow. Not Wendy's, not Ponderosa, McDonald's. That just shows the power that they have in our society. McDonald's is the nation's largest buyer of beef, pork, and potatoes, and the second largest purchaser of chicken. The only fictional character with a higher degree of recognition is Santa Claus, Ronald McDonald. The Golden Arches are now widely, more widely recognized than the Christian cross. What else do we have here? Uh, the hardy independent farmers whom Thomas Jefferson considered the bedrock of American democracy are truly a vanishing breed, part of that again because of standardization. The United States now has more prison inmates than full-time farmers. Which I always kind of downplay that a little bit by saying, you can say that about anything, there are more prisoners than eye doctors or foot doctors or good public speakers, for that, for that matter. <laughs> Um, when you go to a drive-in fast food restaurant, or a sit-down restaurant for that <laughs> who was praying before you started <laughs> eating or not, but again, that's something as people of faith, we always want to remember where our food comes from. Of course, I believe that it, that it comes from God. And I have been very good at shaming priests and nuns in the past by asking that question, oh yeah, I went to McDonald's this morning on the way to the meeting, and, and did you pray, sister, before eating your Big Mac breakfast and the feet get the very long stairs. That's something we always want to do. <laughs> uh, we always, um, when we go through the minivan drive through, we're a very traditional modern American family. We always pray for our, our Big Macs and our poppers and our happy meals, whatever else, because the food does come from God. And we always pray for those who prepare it as well. It's very interesting to note that of all Americans, Hispanics are much more likely to actually go into a fast food restaurant and sit down and eat as a family. For some reason, it always strikes me as very, very interesting, either because it's out of the mainstream of American society today, or Hispanics are just so tied to tradition and so old-fashioned that eating as a family is still something that they do on a routine basis. I remember as, as a kid, um, during the 4 o'clock movie on Channel 7 in Detroit on weekdays, when it was Godzilla week, and even maybe when I was 15, it was still a big deal to me, and, Mom, Mom, can we please, just this one day, watch TV, well, we get her in the living room at the, at the coffee table. Please, please, please. And of course, Mom would be able to do that to us. Now, as a father, I realized what a horrible thing that was that Mom and Dad did by allowing us to do that. Because in our fr frantic, hectic lifestyle these days, the one chance to be together as a family is often at dinner. And to waste that opportunity by eating while watching TV or reading a newspaper, which I'm guilty of, is something that we do. So that's something we want to also, also keep in mind. Obviously, in, in most Christian traditions, and certainly in the Catholic tradition, food being the Eucharist is the greatest sacrament that we have, the great gathering of our, our family as Christians. The same thing should be true in your homes. The chance to eat together and share food and thoughts and prayers is a great thing not to be missed. Advertising pressure, um, we were talking about this a little bit before the meeting. The impact of advertising and our, our diets and where we spend our, mo our money. Greg Lent at a Catholic church and said that uh, you know, if you had to design an advertising campaign, this is something for all of us to think about, if we were going to design an advertising campaign to affect your family or your parish, what would you say in that advertising campaign to get them to go to McDonald's? Bless you, bless you. Um, if you're like my mother, that's going to come for the next 15, 15 times. <laughs> what gets us into restaurants? If, how could we all be like that Hispanic family that actually sits down together and prays over a meal at McDonald's? And the, the kids that I spoke to came up with ideas, the best one of, of which was in the, the Happy Meals during Lent to get Stations of the Cross action figures. <laughs> so it's so all ways that we can meld our faith into, into fast food. Sure, got to get credit for that one. <laughs> You'll also learn from Fast Food Nation that there's a, a industrial plant on the New Jersey Turnpike, again, not to pick on New Jersey, that manufactures the taste 
for fast food. You don't actually taste a Big Mac when you eat a Big Mac. You're tasting chemical additives that taste like a Big Mac. And I've spent billions of dollars, and millions anyway, to perfect the taste of our food, which is why McDonald's is fun to go to, because we know it's going to taste really good. All of us still think that it does taste good. There is actually beef extract in French fries, which is why French fries taste so good to go with Big Mac, because there's already a subtle flavor of beef that matches your hamburger. So when you go and you just want a hamburger and a small Coke, and they say, would you like fries with that? Yes, I want French fries. Please give me French fries and make it a big one, because we're pre-programmed by taste now, not just through advertising, but by taste, to order certain things at fast food restaurants. I think that's also very interesting. So this is just a couple things to think about as how we eat. Now, what do we eat? The very first time that I gave my talk, someone asked beforehand, eating is a moral act. Is there any such thing as a, a moral food or an immoral food? I think there is. They are, they are studying right now at Michigan State, and apparently about a year away from the grocery shelf, human breast milk that will come from cows. They can be mass produced because they are experimenting with the genetic makeup of a cow to have it produce human breast milk. Now, that sounds outrageous. I mean, would that ever actually happen? Would people actually buy that? I would say yes. I can already see the TV ads because my wife was able to breastfeed. And for the first eight months anyway, when our kids were growing up and still are, I had to nudge her and say, Diane, Diane, you know, Aaron's crying. You need to get up because there's nothing I as the father can do. <laughs> you can see the TV ad now, whereas the wife mentioned the husband, oh, you need to run up to seven o'clock and it's your turn to, to, to feed the baby. And there'll be doctors or pseudo doctors on TV dressed in lab coats saying, we all know that human breast milk is the very best thing. Bodies, all the, everything that goes into uh, human breast milk is now available from Hortons or Myers or whatever else. It's safe, it's been purified in a laboratory, and it's gonna be, it'll be cheaper than cow's milk. It's mass produced. Who's not gonna buy that, that great convenience? I would hope if that ever happens, that will actually spur at least the Catholic Church to come out against genetic modified foods because I think that would be the final straw that if you're not going to allow that, which I think is just abominable, you have to draw the line everywhere else. The Catholic bishops right now have not, and with the Pope as well, have not come out against genetic modified foods. I think the statements at this point are needs evaluation, we need to move forward with prudence. God gave us intelligence and science to improve our lives, that's true, but there's been no pronouncement to say these are really good or really bad. But I think the breast milk thing might actually spur, spur some action. So that's something that we are going to eat in a couple of years. When we go to Myers, and I'll pick on Myers because it's a favorite store of mine and it's here in the hometown, uh, it seems like there's just so much food these days. I remember as a, as a young kid helping mom go grocery shopping, there did not seem to be, of course, memory is different now than when I was younger, there didn't seem to be this much food. Especially the produce section, either Kroger's or, or Myers is just phenomenal now. It's brightly lit. In fact, the uh, Book by Nestle, whose first name is escaping me, the Food Politics uh, book, had a very good paragraph on the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden didn't look as good <laughs> as the Myers photo section is now. The, the, the way the mist is coming out of the food and the great variety is just amazing. There was a special last summer on NBC that Tom Brokaw was the host of. He took a group of African students who were allotted so much money to an American grocery store to see how they budgeted their money to show them how Americans buy the food. And they were just amazed big long meat counter, the big produce section, all the frozen foods, all the canned foods, everything else. And they thought for sure this was a special store for government employees. This must just be where you have your special federal government employee pass or something which gets you into that section of the store. No, this is a working class Kroger's in Detroit. They were just amazed that we had that much food. But do we really have as much choice as we think we do? Um, there are hot dog plants, for instance, that manufacture hot dogs all from the same batch of meat, but they go under five different labels. So I'm a ballpark fan, or I'm a high-grade fan, but we're coming from the same company. So there really isn't as much consumer choice as we might think there is. The top five grocery store chains in the United States in 1992, just 10 years ago, controlled 19% of the market. Today, those same five control 47% of the market. I think Kroger is the number one grocery store. The last couple of years with Super Walmart, they've really got, in, got into the, the business here. So we really don't have as much food choice as we think we have when we choose what we eat. And then again, we have gene genetically modified foods, which I'm trying to avoid now, but 75% of the food that we buy, the grocery store already has something somewhere in the food chain, in the ingredients. It's been modified in the laboratory for some reason or another. 
And my example of, of, of GMOs would be this, if you're not familiar with that. People say we've been doing this for 10,000 years. I would beg to differ with that. The old days of having a big field of tomato plants. And this plant over here is the best one, so I'm going to take a seed from this one. And say it goes for next year. And then next year, this tomato plant grew taller than that one. And I'm going to save the seeds from that and put the two together and come up with my Paul's special tomato. That's not, GM, that's not GMOs, that's not modification, that's crossbreeding, that's something that would happen with bees, we're just kind of bringing that along. Now we're changing the actual makeup, so that we put salmon, salmon cells, I think, in potatoes. Salmon's a cold water fish, so if you had a salmon gene, you'd be more prone not to be a subject of pain and suffering from frostbite, or, or early frost. So I would, I would say that in the olden days, if I wanted to have a basketball player at Michigan State as a child, I would need to marry somebody who was seven feet tall, and eventually in a couple of generations we'd get somebody that could do a jump shot and be very, very good playing for the Big Ten. The new system would be, let's take a kangaroo cell and match it with a human cell, and we've got somebody that can jump into in the next generation. So I think it's a leap, a leap of faith and a leap of science that's bringing us the food that we have today. Look, look at the labels of the food that you, if you buy. If you go to Myers, which I did, I'll go again tomorrow probably, the last time I was at Myers, I went to the produce section, and we were buying apples. So I was looking for apples from Michigan. I found apples from Argentina, apples from Washington State, which is where Michigan apples seem to go out to Washington State. I found <laughs> apples from, from Chile and California. I did find a bag of apples from um, Michigan. They work from Grand Rapids, but it was as local as we could get, so that's what we bought. Um, there is a provision in, in the most recently passed uh, U.S. Farm Bill that will be country of origin labeling voluntarily in the next year, I think in two years it kicks in that it has to at least have the country of origin. Look where your food's from. And if you can, support local farmers whenever you can. The average American uh, piece of food travels anywhere from 1,000 miles to 1,500 miles before it gets to your dinner plate. Only 10% of the food that you spend, the food dollar you spend in Michigan actually goes directly to Michigan farmers. Most of our food is sent out to big regional processing plants, then some of it comes back to Michigan, but most of it goes somewhere else. We buy tomatoes these days that are nice and red in the grocery store, but they're picked green, perfectly, perfectly round, and make good weapons, again, for bad public speakers, so I'm glad nobody has <laughs> any modern-day tomatoes out there. And there's a, it's a methane gas, I believe it is, that you, you spray in the back of, of a, a truck, and they turn it right overnight when you, I heard a story, I read a story, of a truck driver who was transporting his green tomatoes, and the next morning he got up, and whoever came out in the back of the truck and sprayed this gas on it, and they turned red, and they were unloaded into the grocery store. It's not the way they're growing in our, in our backyards. So that's something that we also look at you know, in terms of where we eat, eat our food. Meatpacking plants um, have some of the highest incidence of um, employee injuries in the country. Again, this goes back to the morality of eating. Every time you buy something at a grocery store or at a restaurant, there's a whole chain of events that have taken place prior to that moment. So it's the conditions of the meatpacking plants. Chicken processing plants, I believe it's 90 chickens will buy in a minute. At your station, if it is to pull off the wings or to pluck or do whatever else, that's how fast the work is at minimum wage. And yet, when you see chickens on sale for 50 cents off a pound, we're going to run to the grocery store this week because we're so happy that we're so fortunate in the United States to have that opportunity. But who's working under what conditions to bring that food to us that cheap? And food is cheap. Uh, we pay the lowest uh, amount of money per capita in the world as a percentage of our income for food. Now, the average American, myself included, will, will dispute that. When I go to Myers and we have this big, long sheet that says $95, <laughs> it doesn't seem like food is cheap, but it really is. And what we used to spend, again, 50 years ago, as a percentage of our income, it was much larger for food than it is today. Um, animal confinement factories now is, is where we get a lot of our food. A lot of our, our, our poultry and pork comes from CAFOs, fine animal feeding operations now. These big factory farms that have sometimes 15, 60,000 animals at one site where you're boxed into, as, as the animal, a, a cage just as big enough for your, for your body to fit in your mouth to get food for your entire life before you're slaughtered and, and, and sent on for us to eat. And I'm like not against eating meat, that's something that I don't think I'll ever give up doing, but there are and everything else that goes with cake, it's just the treatment of the animals themselves. And again, that's something that we're a part of when we, when we buy pork that's processed that way. You can, if you look at, look at the labels and buy Myers actually carries free-range lamb. We like that a lot. We buy that when we can. Uh, there are things that you can look for in labels if you read small print to make a difference in how you eat your food. I was very glad to find out a couple months ago there was such a thing as organic beer. 
So we're doing our part at our house on hot summer days to, uh, to uh, save the environment and farmers at the, at the same time. Contract farming is another big thing that's changed over the years. A lot of farmers now, they don't raise their own chickens. They buy the eggs from whatever big egg chicken company. They raise the chickens. They pay for the medicine. The chickens die because of the heat or the, the fans uh, burn out or something. The farmer takes the loss. The company comes and picks up the live chickens for processing and they get the profit. So again, that's something that's changed. Mm -hmm. Now here's something that's that's amazing, just in terms of again the control of our, our country. We'll hear people say that well, big, bigger and better farms are just the way of the future. It's irreversible. That's just the way it's got, got to be. Again, the morality would be. Again, the Catholic bishops have been very adamant over the years and decades, in fact, supporting family farms, free enterprise, and the fact that you know, there should be competition. The more people that are involved and have levers on the economy, whether it's in farming or anything else, economic power more equally dispersed is more just. So by losing more and more farmers and producers, we are going into immorality, I think, in the food industry. In beef, chicken, and pork, you know, I love these percentages all together, the top four companies control anywhere from 50 to 81% of the market. Tyson and ConAgra are in the top are the top four in all three of those meat categories. And Cargill is in the top, you know, in two of those groups. So we're getting to the point where we're gonna have two or three companies, if not one company, that controls all of our food supply. And again, this, it's not just that they control the beef processing. Uh, I think that you know, I had this story right because this is just as of a couple months ago. The largest um, pork seller company now controls the largest pork processing plant. Mm -hmm. And these same companies also own very large shares of our grocery store chains and the seeds and the fertilizer. So it's one company that's going to control everything from the seed all the way to your dinner plate, if not the dinner plate itself at some point. So again, that's something. Now, when I went to Mission State many years ago, uh, Walter Adams told us that the Antitrust Act, anytime something got at least as far as 40% of the market control, that was a violation of our federal law and that that company should be bro broken up. How much time did we spend as a country and how much money to attempt to break up Microsoft? Because they control computer chips and PCs. Thank you.